I'll explain it to you really quick. Yeah, yeah. Like you got the pass. One eternity later. So we've been talking so sure. long, we didn't do a proper introduction. Yeah, sounds We're good. here with uh, Dr. Alex Tatum, uh, who's my TRT doctor, who's helped me through dialysis and now helping me through recovery and a little bit of performance when we get there. But right now, yeah. keeping it pretty pretty simple. But yeah. uh, you know, he's a very humble guy, actually very hard to get a hold of. <laughs> when I first tried to get, when I first learned about Alex, um, I went to his clinic and they said he's not seen patients and that I would have to wait a year to get in with him. And they gave me to another doctor who I didn't like very much and ended up dropping out of that program. Yeah. But then it happened one day you walked into ICB and started talking to me about strength training. Yeah. And then you start talking about some of these things like, oh, I, you know, I know what I need to do in order to gain muscle and, you know, things that you were willing to sacrifice in order to be successful. And I'm like, do you mind if I ask you what you do? And I, the reason I asked that is because I knew it had to be something at a high level. I knew that you're a successful guy. You know, you, you're wearing very, very simple clothes. You drive an old truck. Yes. There was no indicators that you were a doctor at the level that you're at or a surgeon yeah. for that matter. But I, I just knew that there was, I was like, this guy does something at a very high level. And then you're like, I do TRT and I'm a urologist. My name is Alex. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, Alex Tatum? And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, I've been trying to get a hold of you yeah. for like the last three years. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's it's funny how uh, you know eventually like people that have like a certain degree of drive like yeah. within like you know a geographic you know distance like you find each other yeah. as time goes on but yeah you know and it's funny because I was looking for you know a quality place to train for so long and you know I'd been to a bunch of different places here around town and you know I walked into you know the old ICB right. and I mean just the moment you walked in like you could just tell that the culture, the drive, the quality of the people in there was something totally different than what you could get anywhere else. Right. And I, I walked in and I was like, this is my new home. I found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Yeah, 100%. Um, so, uh, you know, I appreciate that intro and to give people, you know, a little bit of uh, context. So, you know, my name is Alex Tatum and I'm a board certified urologist. So I did five years of urologic training that includes everything from kidney stones, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, that sort of thing. But about halfway through, I really, you know, discovered that my passion was, you know, helping guys, you know, trying to, you know, uh, live their, live their best lives, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to, uh, reach high levels of performance. I had a passion for people that were dealing with the fallout from cancer, whether that was from testicular cancer, struggling with fertility issues, struggling with testosterone production, guys with prostate cancer, struggling with erectile dysfunction thereafter, because I saw myself in those patients. I saw my cousins, brothers, uncles, you know, I very much identified with that, you know, because I was like, hey, listen, this is something that we're all going to face at some point in our lives. And then ended up going down the pathway of fellowship training, which uh, for me was in uh, male reproductive and sexual medicine. So I went down to uh, Baylor for a year in Houston, Texas, trained with a guy named Larry Lipschultz, kind of a legend in our field. Yeah. And Larry had a real focus on not just the classical areas of uh, men's health, so not just basic ED or right. peyronie's disease, and not just basic TRT, yeah. but really high level andrology. So we were working with a lot of special forces guys, a lot of guys who have stepped on stage at the Olympia. Yeah, pro bodybuilders, I know a few that work with them. Yeah, yeah, and so, you you know, I really got an opportunity to see what uh, andrology and performance enhancement looks at an extremely high level. And not just work with, you guys are like the pioneers in some of those areas. We're, we're fortunate to, you know, be to be very good at what we do. Yeah. And I really, really love my time there with uh, Larry and then came back to Indianapolis to start my own practice, uh, built up a very large men's uh, health center. I'd say yeah. a year out. It's still, wait. it's still growing. I'm trying to hire a partner. We're working on it, but I have very high standards. Yeah, you so, get the right person. For yeah, sure. so we're, we're expanding. And then recently uh, we joined a, a larger national network called U.S. Urology Partners. Uh, and I have a, a role at the corporate level as corporate director of men's health, helping to grow the men's health programs at other locations. That's amazing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you actually worked with uh, 
my surgeon, the guy that did my transplant, yeah, Dr. Goggins over at IU Health, yep, where you were doing your residency, yep, he had some very nice things to say about you, yeah, no. And, and side note, this guy snuck in with his old badge to come <laughs> see me after surgery. You know, I was all laid up on, uh, they had me on a liquid drip of Darvacet, and <laughs> in comes Alex. Uh, yeah, you know, it's amazing. If you just wear scrubs and you act like you know where you're going, nobody <laughs> asks any questions. And uh, The ICU yeah. unit out of everything, you know, oh, should, yeah. should, be, should be a little closed off. You'd, you'd think that, but I mean, I spent, you know, working, I don't know, I spent five years of my life working at that place, 100 yeah. hours a week. So I, I know every nook and cranny. So, um, you know, I was, uh, I was happy to get a chance to see you, you know, kind of immediately post-op. And, you know, I got to say, man, I mean, they've got a great team down there. Oh, yeah. I yeah. feel, you know, between him and uh, working with you, I think I'm in very good hands. Yeah. I'm very confident in, you know, not only making a full you – know, my main priority is health. Health, yes, and but, longevity. And longevity. Yeah. You know, he's like, there's no reason this kidney shouldn't last you 20, 30 years. Yep. And by that point, we'll be able to regenerate our own anyway. So yeah. like as long as we can make it 20 years, I think like yeah. they, they actually had a first genetically modified pig, pig kidney. kidney. I saw, saw that. Yeah. yeah. That was wild. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if it worked once, hey, like, they're just going to they're just going to build off it. But I have nothing but confidence in the two of you. And uh, I've never felt in better hands, you know, yeah. like. Couldn't say that during my dialysis time, and you, yeah. you know that some of the problems I've dealt with yeah. better than most people because I don't really go online talking about my issues. I try to keep things positive, but, yeah. you know. But on, on the other side, I do try to be transparent, yeah. and when we do run into issues, um, I try to talk about it. But you saw firsthand the blood work and the other things, yeah, right. And yeah, some of the missed diagnoses I haven't talked about, mm -hmm. but yeah, maybe I'll get into that another time. Glad to see you on the other side of it. Oh, yeah. 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 Feeling yeah. good now. Yeah. You know, we're still in the early stages, nine weeks post-op. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, after 12 weeks, they're going to start taking those immune suppressors down a little bit. Yeah. So I should be having less. Like, I still can't feel my toes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, like, just now, like, getting my energy back. They still, have, they still have me on prednisone. Yeah. Which I've talked about many times. It sucks. It's a horrible one. Yeah. You know, it sucks, I, man. it's the same stuff they give cancer patients and... Um, basically, my understanding, it's like a very potent uh, steroid yeah. that does catabolic things to your body, but it also is a anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So, I mean, we use that term steroid and we'll get into this, you know, right. a little later and steroid just describes an entire oh. class of molecules right. that have a special four ring structure, but they're actually, you know, uh, androgenic anabolic steroids, which is what we talk about the in the gym. Ones. Yeah. Those are the fun ones, the right? Fun ones. But, you know, from a medical standpoint, we also have glucocorticoids. And so that is what, uh, is based off. That's what, you know, prednisone is. Okay? Not a fun one. Not a fun one because what it's going to do is it's actually going to promote muscle breakdown. Yeah. All right. I've, and yeah. Yeah. And the goal is to try and, you know, decrease the, uh, inflammation and the body's autoimmune response, autoimmune be, meaning whenever your immune system turns on itself. Right? right. And so there's a really big role for prednisone in patients that have an immune disorder where their body's attacking itself or in transplant patients where we need to turn down that immune response because you have a kidney that you weren't born with. Well, that yeah. and the FSGS did come back. Yes. And you were, we had that conversation about the Freesis, yes, which is that the plasma freesis. Yeah, I had to get treatments of that, and then they started me back on IV steroids. Yeah, but they feel like it, it you know, they have if they could catch it early enough, then yeah, it's a non issue. Yes, if you, you wait until you're stage five, like I did, yeah, there's nothing they could do for you. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was uh, having a conversation with a colleague of mine who was a nephrologist yesterday, and we were talking about your case in particular Good. with FSGS. Talk, everybody you get a chance to pick their brain. Absolutely. I'm, you I'm know, come to you. Yeah, well, I was talking to him about the growth hormone thing. Okay. And, oh, good. Yeah, yeah, good. yeah. So, you know, and essentially, you know, the your diagnosis, FSGS, focal segmental 
glomerular sclerosis. Took you a little bit. That is a scarring disorder. Right. And that means that when we biopsy the kidney, we see a certain pattern of scarring there. Yep. But there are all roads lead to Rome, right? There are a lot of different pathways that get to FSGS. Yep. And so I think what a lot of people assumed, and even yourself for a long time, was this is directly the result of anabolic usage. All yeah. right. And although you can see that in particularly FSGS with anabolic usage and uncontrolled hypertension, yeah. You, there's also a genetic version of FSGS, which that took them two years to even do that test on me. Yeah, I was I. Well, they waited until I was on the transplant list, mm -hmm. and then they're like, "Well, maybe we'll see what the actual diagnosis is." Yeah. So they did the genetic testing, and it came back positive. Yes. And yes. my cousin actually has it too. Yeah. And my sister has a different form of it that doesn't attack her kidneys. Sure. But it it turned into like some type of very rare arthritis mm -hmm. where she like had her neck fused and it gets very hard for her to walk at times. But, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I just I think that's a, an important thing for your audience to know because obviously, like we live, eat, and breathe in the fitness world. But no, I mean, it doesn't matter what we tell them; they're going to assume what they want to assume. And eh. like, I don't even fight people anymore. Yeah, because I'm like, hey, I have an autoimmune. They're like, oh yeah, like anabolics didn't. Do, I'm like, because they see that like the pictures I used to have and the videos I used to have, and I'm like, I'm sure those things sped up the process and they weren't helping. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah, maybe. Maybe we but, don't know. But here's what I, here's my rebuttal. Yeah. You know, like I didn't do anything different than my training partners. Yes. And you could take 15 guys that yeah. I can name off. Some of them are still competing at the Olympia. Yeah. Some of them are breaking PRs and world records. Yeah. And I trained with none of them have health issues and I didn't do anything different than what they did. So, well, I, I do think it's important to mention that not everybody responds to those compounds in the same way, but particularly, for, uh, but particularly for, for yourself, you know, I have seen guys on, you know, grams of testosterone and not develop the type of kidney issues that you developed. Did they have high blood pressure? Uh, most of them have high blood pressure because you can't take, you know, more than a, a gram or grams. Uh, oh, well, I mean, by the time you add up all the other anabolics on top of it, right? Because people will say, oh, well, you know, I'm only taking six, 800 migs of test only. Only. And then, yeah, <laughs> only, <laughs> only, only, you know, but then like you start to add in like your VAR and your deck on top of that or, you know, whatever else they're running at the time. Yeah. And then you start to get into a pretty high androgenic anabolic burden. And so that's and, always going to drive some hypertension. But each class of drug, right? Like yeah. not every, like testosterone, you talk about anabolic androgenic. Yeah. And the ratios are different, right? Like my understanding, test is one to one ratio. Well, and that's so the essentially, if you're looking at anabolic steroids, I think the best way to do it is to just kind of mentally think of three different columns, right? Because you are going to have your testosterone derivatives, okay? Right. You are going to have your dihydro testosterone derivatives, and then you're going to have your 19 NORs, okay? And Which those are, are going to be. Well, they are actually the most myogenic, generally speaking, all right? But those uh, those differentiators, those are based off of a lot of mouse studies that were done years ago. Yeah, that's a good point. And again, you know, you can give different patients different, you know, compounds and they're going to react slightly differently. And they consider to do like studies at high dosages with these things inhumane at the moment, right? Well, in the United States. I, I will tell you that, you know, having done a lot of clinical trials and being a part of clinical trials ongoing, that you have to pass everything through an institutional review board or an IRB. And this is a group of people that make sure that whatever you're doing, you know, follows certain ethical standards. Right. And so, you know, we know that whenever you start to do these really, really high doses of compounds, you're gonna start running into cardiac risk and hypertension risk and that sort of thing. So it's never gonna, and for what benefit, right? Yeah. Okay. We're not curing a disease. So want, yeah. it's never going to pass the IRB. I want to get more chicks, man. Like, bro. Like, okay. <laughs> like I'm trying to break 2000 on my total. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like seriously, if you need to run grams to hit a 2k total, then you're in the wrong sport. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it is interesting, you know, talking to guys and hearing their stories about what got them into fitness and what drove them down the path of, you know, trying anabolics and, you know, what they, what they've taken and why it's pretty wild. Yeah. It's pretty wild. And what, what drives them for sure. It, it is. But and the it, reason, the yeah. reason I admit not to cut you yeah, off, no, 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 go but for the it. reason I want to circle back because we talk about the adding up the different types and that we classify it under one gram, two grams, yeah, yeah. but we put it all together. But in reality, not all steroids are equal. No. Like you have some that are more potent, like trend, 
trust alone that's out there yes. now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like the the ratios are different. Like you can run very little amounts of these things and have a huge anabolic androgenic response. Yeah. Where whereas like testosterone, we're all kind of familiar with. Yeah, and you know, milligram. That's just a that just represents the molecular weight of the compound. Okay. And so, you know, you can't really com like compare meds like milligram to milligram, so, but like a good example would be like, you know, 50 milligrams of test is like nothing. Okay. Yeah. But you know, let's look at something like, I don't know, anadrol, right? right. Oxymethylone, yeah, right? Yeah. You take a 50 milligram, you know, a bomb, oh you know, God, and all of yeah. a sudden you're going to have all these freaking back spasms and you're going to feel pumped as all get out and Put you 30 know, pounds of water on and uh, oh, yeah. two weeks. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, you're also going to get stronger in those two weeks because you're oh, going to yeah. get more muscular fiber recruitment. And so, you know, again, you can't really compare, you know, the, these compounds milligram per milligram because yeah. they're they're radically different. Yeah. 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 So side story. Sure. My last meet. Yeah. You know, I decided to get a little more aggressive with gear use. Yeah. And I ran Anadrol. Okay. 50 milligrams. First time I've ever touched it. Yeah. Usually it was like a D ball or an Anavar type of guy. Sure. I, I, I got to big enough yeah. off of uh, DECA and Test. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't need mm. more weight, you know, and Anadrol was pretty notorious for adding weight on. Yes. So in the last four weeks, I was putting up some great numbers 274 walking around. In the last four weeks, added in the Anadrol. Yeah. Um, within three weeks, it gained 25 pounds of water, straight kidney failure. Dude. <laughs> but like I'm thinking, you know, like pitting edema yeah. around my legs and I'm like showing people and they're like, oh, it's just Anadrol. I'm like 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember Chad, my coach at the time was like, man, that's the worst case of edema I've ever seen. You know? Yeah. Like, and I, I hit the squat PR, but I uh, tore my pec. I think most people know that story now. Yeah, and I was thinking like, what did I do differently? But you know, now we know I was in late stages of kidney failure. Yeah. But the whole time I'm I'm attributing all the weight gain to the anadrol. But, yeah. <laughs> which probably shut down the kidneys pretty hard. I mean, anadrol is a tough one to metabolize. It's really hard on the liver. And so if you look at you know the old school anabolics, okay? So uh, we're excluding all the SARMs, right? Um, but anadrol, at least uh, per my recollection, it's pretty much the only one that we know is an at a carcinogenic risk. Oh my God, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you- What can, class of carcinogen? Uh, so you can get a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma from you know ongoing anadrol usage because it is so hard on the liver. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, and so what's interesting is that for most of these compounds, right, that they were originally developed and used in a clinical setting. And then we developed other things that were more effective. So for example, nandrolone was originally developed for kidney failure patients as a way to generate more red blood cells, right? Yeah. As opposed to now we have erythropoietin, okay, which is EPO, which is the thing that your kidney makes in order to st stimulate red blood cell production. Yeah. So what happens now is nandrolone is approved and it can still be compounded. You know, it's still legal in the United States when prescribed by a doctor, but you're not going to find it at CVS, right? Right. So, um, it, but generally speaking, the milligrams and the dosages that were used in the trials were much less than what we use in, when it comes to you running gear, okay? Right. Um, Anadrol is one of the exceptions where it was tested at a 50 milligram dose, which is freaking insane. Okay. <laughs> if you look at, you know, what the risk profile comes at that, you know, in reality, you could probably run Anadrol at a lower dose of like 20, 25 milligrams for a longer period of time with a lot less risk and still get significant benefit from and it. And what, what was it compounded for? Like it was originally was it? for muscle wasting. So for, and you know, honestly, these compounds still have role, a role for that. You know, I will have patients who are going into, if they have a known diagnosis of hypogonadism and let's say they're going into a major surgery. So let's say uh, bladder removal for bladder cancer. So that's a big surgery. And yeah. those patients often have to go through chemotherapy or immunotherapy prior to bladder removal. And so they're getting hammered, they're losing muscle, they're you know losing a lot of their physiologic reserve before their big surgery. If you can put those guys on a, you know let's say aggressive uh, TRT regimen and you throw in some of these other compounds like nandrolone on top of it, they can actually maintain a lot of their muscle mass that they would normally have lost and they'll recover quicker from their uh, surgery. And so, that you know, there are positive clinical applications to these 
these uh, compounds, you know, outside of just the gym and performance. Well, people think of these drugs mm. and we, we talk about gaining muscle, yeah. but it really comes down to protein synthesis. And yeah. there's a lot of internal, like me and you did talked about, yeah, you might not be building muscle, but your body is healing. Is healing. Yeah. Which takes a lot of energy. So yeah. when you talk about promoting muscle growth and, uh, uh, what we're what we're also talking about is recovering from these major exactly. surgeries. Exactly. So if you look at you know any uh, you know refrigerator on uh, what we call the med surge floor, so where patients go after their surgery, it's going to be full of protein shakes. Now you know it's not like you know the giant tubs that you know we have at home, right? Yeah. But you know these are going to be you know specially formulated shakes that you know have you know pretty decent amount of protein. We're talking yeah. like you know 20, 30 grams. Yeah, you know, they were given to me when I was in. Yeah, patient. exactly. Because we know that protein intake is so important for healing. Okay. Yeah. So and it's hard to eat on some of those meds. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're trying to get the calories in however you can, man. Yeah. Especially they harp protein. Yeah. People are like, are you, are you on a protein restriction now? I'm like, no. Yeah. They, they told me to eat like 200 grams of protein. Yep. And I'm like, I started adding up all, all my meals. I'm like, it's hard for me to get to it at the end of the day. Yeah. Because some of the medication I'm taking makes it very hard to eat. Yeah. And honestly, if you have a protein first diet, I mean, it, unless you are in the later stages of kidney failure, which is about the only thing I can think of off the top of my mind where you should limit your protein intake, you know, uh, you are going to be much better off when it comes to your body composition. Late stages, but not dialysis. No, not dialysis. It doesn't matter at dialysis. Yeah. yeah. By the That's time you're on dialysis. All yeah. the time. And I try to explain to them. I'm like, the dialysis machine is your kidney at that point. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. They want you to, because they want a certain level of albumin. Yep. And if you're not eating enough protein, then that go, number goes down. Then you're really going to get edema, right? Because you're going to yeah. get third spacing of all that fluid. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, it was funny. I had a patient that I had to operate on, uh, yesterday and, uh, beforehand, I'm a big believer in trying to avoid narcotics, uh, after surgery for patients. Cause it really just slows down the gut, slows down recovery. You know, you if can't you, poop. Yeah, you can't poop. It's miserable. So uh, I I use a a pretty, you know, um, aggressive non-narcotic protocol. And I had a patient I was operating on. He's already on dialysis. And uh, I had him take uh, some uh, NSAIDs, you know, Briar. And he was, you know, he was holding off on taking it. I was talking to him pre-op. He's like, oh, you know, isn't this going to, you know, hurt my kidney? I'm like, what, are you going to go on more dialysis after this? He's like, that's a good point. He's like, thanks, doc. (laughs) Yeah. So, um some nephrologists are going to get after me at this because like, Oh, if you damage the kidney, maybe they're not going to pee as much. And there's a role for that because if you pee, you can still help with, you know, a urine fluid production. Retention yeah. At the very least. Yeah. It's going to help with your fluid balance. This patient in particular was already totally didn't make urine anymore. So yeah. it truly did not matter. Well, I wish more nephrologists would care about those things because I was prescribed something, uh, that is primarily used for like hair growth and they're using it as blood pressure. Oh, minoxidil? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, like, Lauren was like, you're, you're not supposed to give that to people that are having kidney issues. And then that is when I stopped urinating. Yeah. And that was like, don't be surprised if you gain a little weight. Well, I ended up in the hospital because my lungs filled up with fluid, and they'd had to do an emergency over the weekend they had treatment. To, yeah, they had to pull the fluid off of you. Yeah. They had to dialyze you, basically. I fired that in the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, they, what's really interesting is that, uh, I've been on that med before at the low doses to try and keep my hair. And <laughs> I, it gave me the sort of edema that you described. Yeah. And I remember being at a barbecue with my wife. It was like a chili cook off and I was sitting there and I was like, my legs feel kind of tingly. Yeah. And then like, I looked down there and I can like, you know, push in it and then you get that edema. And I was like, Whoop, coming off of this real fast. Sure the sodium didn't help either. Oh uh, yeah, of course not at a chili cook off. Yeah. God. No. So, uh, you know, Hey, I'll go bald eventually, but I'm going to embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. Rock it. It's a good, it works for the rock. Yeah, exactly. So you just got to get muscular enough that it doesn't matter. That's true. You know, I just got to put on about 50 pounds of muscle (laughs) and then just never talk about my rampant gear use. (laughs) So you never got, gave an answer when you said you were talking to a colleague about the growth hormone, because I am very interested. Yeah. I sent Alex a link. That was basically saying that growth hormone could be beneficial to uh, post-transplant patients. Yeah. Um, in the sense that it could enlarge the actual transplanted kidney. Yes. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that 
we get you know concerned about with growth hormone use in competitors is organomegaly. And so like you can look back at the physiques that we saw back in the golden era with Arnold versus what we see with the GH gut. The GH gut, yeah. right? And so what they say is, oh, you know, the this is causing, you know, growth of internal organs, not just, you know, musculature. And but that could actually be a good thing if you are dealing with a transplanted kidney that is smaller than, you know, you would want. You're trying to add mass to it. And so which um, is one of the problems I'm running into my creatinine being like two, 2.2, 2, mm -hmm. and they're saying like, hey, you got it from a girl, my sister. Yeah, you smaller know, it, human. It's smaller human. Yeah, now the thing is, is that uh, there's no evidence that it actually shows like regeneration of actual nephrons, which is what we need, which is the filtration unit of yeah, the kidney. Yeah, we don't want a big kidney that just works the same. Exactly, so uh, it does uh, provide benefit when it comes to um, like imp causing you know loss of fat, gaining of muscle. Like we know that growth hormone usage, responsible growth hormone usage leads to positive uh, metabolic effects, but it has yet to be the silver bullet to try and like re completely reverse all the damage that's done by you know a failing kidney. Well, I, and I've ran actual GH before. Yeah, and from different pharmacies, but yeah, um, not the not the green tops, blue tops, black tops. People are getting from China. You don't know what the fuck's in it. Yeah, like I like I ran Serostem and I have ran Nordepens. Yep. Um, usually at like two or three I use. Yes. And I would say, and but never enough to create like a GH gut. Yeah. So like in order to create true hyperplasia, which is the growth yeah. factor, you have to run it like seven plus, eight plus. Oh, I've seen guys on 11 and 12 units a day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't feel comfortable enough to say his name, but people would know who I'm talking about. He is a heavyweight Olympian champion. And he told me 15. That's and wild. He was doing like seven and a half and then seven and a half. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you run into problems with insulin resistance whenever you start taking that much uh, growth hormone. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm sure he was on some insulin as and, well. And then you add in the insulin on top of that to make up for it. So, I mean, you can, like I tell guys, you know, whenever you start adding when compounds, when you start running gear, and especially when you start running higher doses and, you know, not, this is before you even get to the realm of growth and in insulin. You know, this is the equivalent of taking your car and going 200 miles an hour as fast as you can down the highway. And, you know, that is going to carry with it, you know, risk. Can you do it? Yeah. Um, are there ways to do it safely? Um, there are, there are ways to mitigate risk, but you're never going to zero out that risk. Right. right? And so I want to, I want people to ask themselves before they make that decision, make that jump. Like, why am I doing this? Right. Okay. Right? right. Like, what is my goal here? Because, you know, if your goal is just to like pull more chicks, I don't know, dude, learn how to tell a freaking joke. That's right. going to like give you a, a lot better return than a bottle of test. Right. right. Now, if you're a competitor, okay. And you are at that level where, you know, listen, we know past a certain level in powerlifting, strong man, bodybuilding, you can't proceed past a certain level unless you're on gear. Okay. And that is a certain, that's a conversation that can be had. All right. right. But even in those fields, how many of those guys actually get to a point where they're like a Chris Bumstead, you know, where they're like a Ronnie Coleman, where they've achieved so much that it's, it's worth that trade or that risk. Very few guys. Yeah. And what gets me is like, there are the genetic anomalies that can get away without running gear and still have huge totals Yeah, and break, tw you know, 20, 2000 plus. Yeah. And we see that in the IPF and, and, mm -hmm. and there are guys that can get to a certain level of leanness, muscle development without gear. Yes. And then there are guys on gear that don't have any of that. Yeah. You know, so, but they, everybody wants to point to these outsiders. Yeah. Right. As the norm. And that's not the norm. No. Like, like the guy at your gym who's drinking and smoking and doesn't diet and works out sporadically and takes a bunch of gear is not the norm. Like, they, yeah. like people are like, oh, steroids are horrible and they don't even work. And like, you're just like, dude, no, this is, that's a person that's irresponsible using. Yeah. Now, if you're talking about someone that's developed good habits over the course of years mm -hmm. and now is adding in because he wants to reach that level, yeah. like that's a different type of conversation than just a, some dude yeah. that on and off of the gym for years and then throws it in. 
Yeah. I mean, I see in the best example I can give people is, you know, I, I've got a lot of fat dudes on testosterone <laughs> in my clinic, man. I mean, because, you know, they've developed a low testosterone due to primarily a lot of lifestyle choices right. that, you know, have got them behind the eight ball and their body isn't able to catch back up because they're later on in life. And so, uh, but they still have, you know, the same habits that led them there. So it's not like they start testosterone and all of a sudden they, you know, sh show up yoked, right? Right. You know, what is going to drive your physique and your performance are going to be your habits, right? And it's... If you think that you know testosterone is going to be the silver bullet, um, the answer is absolutely not. There is no silver bullet. Okay, what gets you the physique that you want and that level of performance? It's diet, sleep, training, and you have to have all of those things dialed in before you even start worrying about supplements making a difference. Yeah. Much less adding in gear on top of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the sad reality is, there's a certain guys that are going to beat you no matter what you do. 100%. Like he said, how yeah. many guys get to that level? Not many. No, very few. And you know what? I mean, that's what makes it competition, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think that as you, as we get older, right, you know, and you and me are about this time where you start to shift a bit of your mindset where, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to beat the guy next to me. I mean, I still, you know, want to, you know, maybe put on an extra plate depending on the day, but really I, you're trying to perform at your possible, at your best, yeah. right? And your best for where you are at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, when I was competing, I always compared myself to the best in the world. Like, yeah. I wasn't looking at and at the time, you know, before I found powerlifting, there was no competition. Mm -hmm. I'd walk into a LA fitness and there might be another Jack guy, but he wasn't lifting the weights I was lifting. He's not putting four plates on in the middle yeah, of an LA they, fitness. He looked like a, he, everybody's just like watching the show. I remember, um, my girlfriend, girlfriends throughout the years, different girls at different times, but they would get jealous because people would be staring at me and I'm like, you have to understand, they're not looking at me because they're attracted to me. No. They're looking at me like they would a circus freak. Like, this is not, and that's something you see every day. Yeah. Like, they don't see people lift these types of weights. That's why they're staring at me. Yeah. And I had to explain that to them, but I don't think all of them got it. I was at a, uh, I thought it was funny. I was at a uh, LA fitness in uh, Miami. I was doing a, uh, doing a course down there and you know, like the, the 45s they had, like I could only put five plates on when I was deadlifting yeah. and like, you know, people look at you like you're <laughs> like, you know, again, like some sort of freak. Maxing out the bar. <laughs> I know. Right. And like here, like nobody would look twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is what I love about this place, right? Yeah. Because, like, it's just, you know, people, you know, this place is, like, accepting and inclusive on a different level, right? But if they are looking, they're cheering you out. A hundred percent, right? If you're at LA Fitness and they're looking, they're quick to look away the minute that you make eye contact with anybody. No, I mean, but here people clap for you. You've always got, you know, guys that are willing to spot you if yeah. you're going for, like, a PR or something like whether, that. Whether you ask them to or not. Yeah. Like, sneak up behind you. You got two more. You're like, dude, it's just a single. <laughs> it was just a single. Let's go. Oh, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What gets me is that whenever that happens to me when I'm here uh, at my normal hour, which is like five something in the morning, oh, I'm geez. like, bro, the pre workout is not even kicked in yet. <laughs> let's no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh, pros and cons yeah. of working with competitive athletes. Hey, I you, would. You get guys that are really into it and they, that all they want is for other people to succeed yeah. along with them, which is a great group to be with, but. It can be a lot, especially when you're on program for an RPE seven. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, it's a. Uh, I think that you know you can. Different gyms have different amenities, but you know I think one of the best things that you've got here uh, that you can't replicate elsewhere is the culture. Yeah. And you know I think that's a credit to you because I think that you know leadership kind of sets that. You set the tone for your employees, and then they set the tone for the people that walk in here. And I think that you've got a really fantastic you know group of athletes here, uh, a bunch of clients, and you know I think that that's going to be what you know kind of propels you guys moving forward because you. You've got that that intangible that culture figured out, and you know then it's easy to add on the sauna or whatever it is down yeah. the line. Yeah, you know? yeah, and it just makes it better to train. Yeah, you know you got different people at different levels. Like we got guys that are going to break world records here. Yep. But we also have guys that are never even going to place at a meet, mm -hmm. you know, or touch a stage bodybuilding. But they're they're still a part of something. 
Exactly. And, and they're, they're just happy to be a part and, of it. And they're just as welcome here. Yeah. And those guys that are going to be the record breakers or will spot them. But they get they get actual feedback from those dudes. Yes. You know, and like they'll spend time talking to people. Yeah. Like it's not like the old days where it's like the big guy goes in the corner and doesn't talk to anybody and just listens to his music. Like most guys here don't even wear headphones. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I'd like to say we got a good good choice of music here, but yeah. it's also like people want to talk to each other. Yeah. And you get to pass down that knowledge, but also like even if you're the top dog, mm -hmm. you, there's always something you can learn. Yes. And they're like, did you ever think about trying this or why'd you do it that way? And even you explaining it mm -hmm. helps you understand it more. Yeah. One thing I've appreciated is being, you know, like you know, despite my age, a relatively like newer lifter compared to a lot of these guys is, you know, I'll ask guys when they're done with their set, hey, would you mind like showing me or giving me some of the cues that you're using like for your rows? Yeah. Like, cause every time I feel like I do it, I feel like I'm tweaking my neck. Like, yeah. and you know, they'll, they're like, oh yeah, absolutely, man. Whenever I was doing it, he's like, you know, drop the weight, you know, do this focus on pulling through the elbows yep. and you know, people that are willing to take the time yeah. and that's what makes it a joy to come here. Yeah. You go to a commercial gym and it, you, they can't be bothered. I remember, yeah. you know, I had, I don't remember, 455, 495, something on the bar yeah. where I asked for a spot and the guy was like, well, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable spotting you. There's no way I could help you out if you can. And I'm like, dude, I just need you to help push it out. And if I need a little tap, like take 20 pounds. But I said, he said, fuck it. So that just motivated me. So I went over there and did a double without, with no spot. And then he, of course, he's standing in the background watching me, Yeah, you know? And I'm like, so you can't help a guy, but you'll sit there and watch me. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, but, um, yeah, man, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm pretty interested to see how this kind of, uh, fitness space develops as time goes on. I'm hoping that we can get more education amongst doctors because I feel like we've, uh, really kind of neglected, uh, this, you know, group of patients and guys. I mean, you told me that, you know, before, you know, working with me, you hadn't really worked with, you know, any doc before. No. And I mean, a lot of that was, you know, the, one, the few times I did try to get some guidance. Sure. The guidance was always like, stop doing what you're doing. Or like, look at your, they'd like do some blood work and just say, they wouldn't, they wouldn't help. You yeah. Know? And it's like, I'm going to be doing this regardless. Mm -hmm. Like all, you could at least try to get me healthy yeah. and put me like on a blood pressure med or, or whatever it was. And, or at least do some genetic testing. I could have found out about this disease years ago. Yeah. But instead I was turned off by doctors. Yeah. Because the lack of empathy and the lack of understanding that, you know, this guy wants to be at a at a level of competition that most people can't get to. Yeah. And you know, not not willing to help at all. Yeah. I think when I talk to other doctors, what I try to tell them is that, you know, Number one, I mean, these compounds are pervasive, whether or not you know about it. But if you've seen a Marvel movie in the yeah. past couple of years, you know, if you followed anybody on Instagram or you've had, you know, any, you know, impressive physique come across your, your feed, okay, you've seen the effects of anabolic steroids. Okay. Yeah. These things are everywhere. Yeah. All right. And so and that's what a lot of people don't understand. They don't. They don't. They, they don't. And the, I always tell people, though, like, once you've done it yourself, you kind of know what to look for. Yes. And you're like, this guy's taking shit. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, it's funny because like you try to like write it down on a piece of paper, it's kind of difficult, but you develop a bit of a sixth sense after you've both been on it. And when you spend enough time in the gym or me seeing dozens of patients every single day yeah. who are on it, you can start to pick it apart. But you know, the first thing I tell doctors is number one, these compounds are ubiquitous. Okay. And they're used and they're going to be used. All right. So once we've gotten that out of the way, then our question, the question becomes like, how do we help our patients? All right. And I think that this, this was a place that we reached when it came to like pain medication many years ago, yeah. you know, realizing that, you know, if you just tell someone, Oh, don't do that. Well, it's not going to work. Okay. So what we really need to do is to improve education, to talk about harm reduction. Right. All right. So, okay. You've made the choice to do this. All right. You're an adult. Let's talk about how we can try to keep you as healthy as possible or, and you know, maybe you'll listen to me when I talk about what are the real risks of this, not as a, just don't do this, but Hey, listen, I see this and this on your labs. And 
and this is where I think it's going to go in two to three years. You know, let's get like a calcium CT on your heart. Let's see, you know, if there's any plaque distribution. Let's look at your creatinine or a cystatin C, which is a better measure of kidney function, and see where we stand. Which hasn't been talked about at all to me. So I'm like, I want to get my kidney work done with you and uh, make sure that I'm on the right path here. Yeah, and so I think that you know, having those sorts of open conversations are going to be much better for patients because I think that uh, you even you told me that after we started working together, you know, you were taking probably some of the lower doses of you know a medication you've ever taken, but you were still feeling you know as good as you were on dialysis. Yeah, yeah. but I also was really just taking tests. Yep, and then me and you added in. Uh, DECA to help the joints. Yep. And that improved the red blood cell, like yeah, you count. mentioned. Yep, because you were and really anemic. I was, and I was taking uh, Mercera, which is an EPO. Yep. And then we also had HCG, mm -hmm. which I have, haven't really used much. Yep. And you also had me on an AI, which I usually didn't take. Yeah. So the mix of that, you know, was it was a cocktail of things. But it was also very low dose, mm -hmm. and um, especially the test for me, like two twenty five a, a week, yeah, is uh, you know normally my cruising dose was like two fifty a week, yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't that off, much off. And then you add in the deca, so it, it probably was a little bit more. But um, yeah, the best I'd felt the entire time, yeah. Like Lauren noticed the difference in me. I had more energy, and uh, you're talking about a very sick patient. Yes. And I think what's important is that, you know, everything that we did was very purpose driven, right? Yeah. Like, and my lab work got better. Your lab work got better, yeah. right? Okay. Like your, uh, your lipids like got so much better. Right. Okay. We were able to get you to a point where your blood pressure was dialed. All right. Yo, yeah, yeah. They had to take me off of meds cause it was getting, um, what do you call it? When you stand up? Hypotensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But and it was like 70 over 40. They're like, this is a problem. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, you were ha you were getting ready for a major surgery with your transplant. Yeah. And you were going to be walking through that door really anemic. And so adding in something like Nandrolone, again, understanding what this compound is, why it was developed, adding yeah. it in, helping your joint pain, but also getting you in a better condition for surgery. Right. I mean, this is the textbook application for this. And so that's why I think it's important that doctors learn about this sort of thing because you can make a profound difference in patients lives you yeah. know if you know how to apply it judiciously yeah yeah and for the record i'm not taking any of those things now i'm only taking uh the prescribed trt dose yep and i just started that back up what a week ago yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah. before that it was like very little test um you know i was allowing my body to recover from surgery but I also noticed a big dip. I remember texting you and I'm like, yeah. I feel like shit, dude. Yeah, to be clear, uh, I told him to keep taking his testosterone during recovery, but <laughs> you were taking so many other meds. I think it was it hard was to keep that, up with it. You know, I had a huge scar in my abdomen and we do the daily the, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like there was this days I didn't feel like poking myself. Yep. And then, so it was, it was um, that. And I also wanted to see how it reacted to my creatinine. So I wanted a baseline. Sure. And I wanted to see what it was. You know, it wasn't the smartest idea not to stop taking everything. Like, no. But I wanted to see a baseline, get my creatinine levels down, and then start back on the dosages and see if it reacted at all. Yeah. Because even though you had told me it won't affect it, it's like, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm still Steve and I'm going to test. That's fine. You're, test st it. You're, you're still going to be your own guinea pig. That's yeah. all right. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I got to do like, you know, you tell me something's hot. I got to burn at least one finger to, to find out for myself. Hey, I'm, I'm the same way. So, so yeah. I and that and it, nothing occurred. You know, my creatinine levels didn't go up. Mm -hmm. um, I started adding an exercise the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I wanted to be careful that I'm not doing anything to put this kidney at risk. Yeah. I waited so long to have it. And I want really, like we talked about longevity out of it, I don't want to fuck it up. Yeah. So I, I did take six weeks off and then started back in slowly. And now here we are nine weeks out and mm -hmm. I'm back to my regular dose. Yeah. No effect on my creatinine levels. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the plan moving forward from here for you. Okay. Yeah, I'm comfortable doing that on here. Yeah. So you're at nine weeks now, right? right. Okay. And so we're going to get to 12 weeks. All right. And then Which we're, we talked about before surgery. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah, so we've been talking about it. It was me before. texting you. I'm like all excited about it. I'm like, here's what I think. And then you're like, I concur. Yeah. And I was like, all right. 
Yeah. So plan is to try and get back to not just range of motion training, but, you know, really start to, you know, try and do some resistance uh, training about 12 weeks. Well, not only that, but put, put some actual lean tissue on. Yeah. And it, it, you know, like you said, these drugs that I'm taking mm-hmm. will, and the surgery itself is just, I've noticed my body composition. This is the worst shape I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, I'm 250 pounds. Um, I was... 240 something and then they put me back on the on the prednisone jumped up to 260 again but all water weight yeah but this body comp wise this is the worst my body's ever been Mm -hmm. and you know i i'm being patient with myself and Mm -hmm. understanding like hey it's just a a harder surgery yeah normally i have orthopedic surgery i can still train legs or i can still train upper body your whole body is screaming right now dude i can't do anything (laughs) and like even walking and like you have i have an 18 inch scar going across the right side of my abs to like uh, way underneath my belly button yeah. like you know I, I have more empathy for women that have had c-sections and getting back into training after that like it's scary like i don't want to herniate it but nope. i also don't want the internals to get messed up so um i do have a lot of catching up to do yeah so i do need i don't want to gain weight mm-hmm. i just want to recomp my body at where i'm at yeah Yeah. Well, and I think that you're going to start to shed some of this water weight, you know, once we get to about, you know, 12 weeks, but you know, during that time, you know, obviously we're going to be keeping a close eye on like your urine studies, making sure that we don't get any protein in the urine, make sure the kidney is healthy. Yeah. And so far it's been immaculate. They said they found zero protein. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Which is a a clear cut sign of specifically my disease. Yes. Yes. With your type of FSGS, that's going to be the canary in the coal mine. The first thing we see. Yep. So, uh, start to do a little bit of training at, uh, 12 weeks. Okay. Putting on some lean tissue. And then, you know, the hope is that, you know, once you've had an opportunity to do some traveling and, you know, enjoy life a little bit, start to see, you know, what you've got left, you know, in these next couple of months. Yeah. I would flip it and say, Oh really? <laughs> the training comes first. Training first. When I can okay. squeeze in the traveling, it'll be there. But like one of my favorite things to do is travel yeah. and find other local gyms to train at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and at big enough cities, I probably know somebody there. Yeah. And I hit up their, them, go to their gym, train with other people, tell them how much better Indy City is, <laughs> and then uh, and go find a great place for a post-workout meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of my, me and Lauren, we, we love it. We I, love traveling. I've even like shot the idea of like making a YouTube series about it. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. so. Right? Yeah. Like you go do an epic workout. Yeah. And then you film the best place for post-workout meal. Yeah, that'd be a lot of, that'd be fun. Yeah, we should, we should go to Vegas and go to, what is it? Uh, Sin City uh, Barbell. It just opened Sin City up. Iron. Sin City Iron. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't been to the new one and uh, there's a lot of great equipment there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cause I know that, uh, I saw a lot of hammer strength stuff, uh, whenever they're, they post hammer strength, yeah. elite and arsenal. Okay. And then he did a couple of custom pieces by William strength. Okay. And they made exactly what he wanted. Yeah. So he got a couple of pieces that only he has. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you, by the way, this is a total side like tangent, but that, uh, arsenal, like lateral raise like that, that machine editing is the best. Yeah. yeah I, I love, love that thing. I yeah. know it was one of the cheaper pieces we had from them too. Really? Yeah. We're totally worth it. But I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple, but yeah, it, it works. Not going to be used for a lot of different things. It's pretty much lateral raise or front raise. Like, yeah. It's not as dynamic as some of their other pieces. Yeah. Yeah. I love it as well. Yeah. It's uh, I, I like training to like pass like failure, like whenever your uh, like technique just goes to crap because oh, yeah. you can just, you can go there and just lower the weight until you're just totally fried. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty much what I'm, I, I start at. These <laughs> just, I just come in gassed. Yeah. But no caffeine, no, just trying to eat what I can and sleep as much as I can. But it's not much. I'm averaging like five hours a night right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, that's brutal, man. Just the prednisone keeping you up? Yeah. Whoa. So one time I take a Klonopin at night. Yep. And prednisone looks suspiciously like Klonopin. Yeah. ruh Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, one night I took, uh, it, I'm supposed to take two milligrams. I take two out of there. 
So it was two prednisones. Yeah. Right before I went to bed, I was up till five in the morning. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that bed. sucks. And it causes me to be agitated yeah. and anxious. Yep. And like, I'm very short tempered on it. So I try to take it when I don't have to train people. <sighs> Dude, I've taken a uh, prednisone for you know, just a handful of times and like I get the wildest dreams on it. I get manic. It that is, was it, man. When I yeah. fell asleep, I had the craziest dreams and I didn't figure out yeah. that I had taken the prednisone. Yeah. I didn't figure out that it was, I take, took the prednisone and the clonopin to the next day. Yeah. I just thought I was having a rough night. Yeah. And then I went the next day and was like, oh, crap. I switched it to And I was like, Daddy, I had the wildest dreams that night. Yeah. I, I told like three people about it. I was like, dude, it's like bothering me. Yeah. They were very graphic and very, very aggressive. Yes. Like, yes. I, uh, I hate taking you know, prednisone for that reason. You know, we should, I, I'll have to do some, you know, uh, reading on my end, make sure it's good with the, the transplant, but uh, it might be helpful to get you on a little bit of magnesium before you go to bed. They, yeah. They've said that, uh, suggested it. Yeah. Yeah, because I came in low, I'm peeing so much still. Yeah. Uh, I think it leveled off a little bit, but that the only real issue I've had is potassium because I was like so potassium restricted. Yeah. That sometimes I'll, like... And they don't account for how much I eat, you know? So they'll say, yeah, go have potato. But I'm eating like a large thing of fries and then having avocado and then having banana. Yeah. And it's like, you could have like one of those things. Yeah. I think it's, it's pretty funny listening to the, uh, you're kind of learning the hard way, how much of modern medicine is very cookie cutter, right? Yeah. It's one recommendation for everybody, regardless of gender or body what, type. What got me was like, I was getting the same recommendation as a 70 year old woman next to me who weighs, you know, 50 pounds. Yeah. Cause she hasn't eat, been able to eat, but once a meal. Yeah. And the same recommendation as like the 300 pound guy who doesn't like to taste the water. <laughs> that's sitting three and i'm like are you fucking kidding me like there is nothing you could tell me i have to eat or drink or can't eat or can't drink that i'm not willing to do in order to make this kidney healthier yeah like it, like this guy's not drinking water and his his functioning is going horribly and his recovery the, the dr goggins yes was like if you don't start taking care of yourself i'm gonna take this kidney out of you and put it in someone that's gonna t value it and that's when i knew i liked it yeah. That's when I was like, this is a doctor I can go with. So uh, you are you hit the money on with, with Goggins. You know, he's a bit of a legend at the at the hospital. And I knew that he was somebody that I would, you know, lay down in traffic for when one night I had to take care of a really sick patient. This is when I was in training. And it was just one of those situations where, you know, you're given meds and you're literally just sitting right outside their room, checking their vitals, checking the urine output, you know, trying to do whatever you can to keep the kidney going through the night. And I was uh, texting Goggins during that time. And uh, afterwards, you know, the patient did well, you know, made it out. And I came in to, for rounds the next day and there was like a big, like a six pack of IPAs at the time <laughs> that Goggins brought in for me as like a thank you. Yeah. And I was like, I, and at this time I was like, you know, a lowly little intern, you know, yeah. that's my first year. Like I'm like the lowest man on the totem pole there, but you know, he made himself available to be on the phone with me that night to help walk the patient through what they needed. Uh, and then, you know, went out of his way to, you know, thank me with some pretty good beer, you know, yeah. afterwards. And I was like, nobody else would do this. Well, yeah. We, we could argue about IPA being a good beer, but yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be a different episode. That's a, that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Okay, sure. And uh, wrapping things up. We always could talk for hours. Yeah. Good conversation. Always great when we get together. And we'll continue the trend. So we'll yeah. have you back here soon. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure.